We're talking about Chinuch. Chinuch al Tanis HaKedish. So I'm supposed to tell you some stories in the spirit of Chinuch al Tanis HaKedish. I'll give you good news and bad news. They're both the same thing. We're dedicating just this morning to that topic. Whatever we don't do, we don't do. We'll just tell some stories. The, um, the Friedrich Rebbe describes in some detail his own chinuch. He doesn't describe everything. There, there's a lot that he leaves out. But there's a considerable measure of detail in the descriptions of how his father raised him. And it was a very interesting child-rearing. I wouldn't say necessarily that it's a typical child-rearing because the Fidika was not a typical child and his father was not a typical father. And his mother was not a typical mother. Both in terms of how wonderful they were and in terms of how much they expected. But I'll share this with you. In Tafresh Mem Vov, 1886, the Fidikim was five, five and a half. And his father was very ill, very ill. So ill that there was a reasonable possibility that God forbid he would lose his life. So he wrote his first of several wills. He wrote several wills to Rebbe Rashab during his lifetime. Each time, because he thought, he, in quotes, he wasn't going to make it, end quote. And the first one was written in Tafresh Ben Vav. The Rebbe was around 25. And um, the will is published. It's printed. And it's called Chanoich Lenar. Chanoich Lenar, how you raise a child. Chanoich Lenar. And in this Chanoich Lenar, the Rebbe Rashab writes 15 or 20 pages. It's, 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 a, it's a will. It's, a, it's an essay. It's a maimed, if you will where he's describing, where he's communicating his philosophy of education and his mandate for education. In other words, he's telling his wife how she should raise their son if, God forbid, he is absent. So the spirit of the letter is chanech l'nad. How do you raise children? You raise children on faith. You raise children on sincerity and on simplicity, on tmimus. In other words, in contrast to the Rambam, the Rebbe has so many sikhs that this idea comes up. In contrast to the Rambam, where the Rambam translates chanech and the way you raise children is you bribe them. Because when children are little, they cannot be expect, expected to do things altruistically, idealistically. Children need to have a motivation. So when you're dealing with little children, you have to give them things. You give them cookies, you give them toys, you give them money, you give them honor, flattery, and eventually they mature to a level where they're doing things just for the sake of the deed. So the, the Rebbe Rashab writes in this essay, Chanech Lenar, a different idea altogether, a Hasidish idea, which is that Jewish children are closer to Gan Eden. They were born more recently. And they are therefore much more sensitive, they're much more in touch with their soul. And Chanech Lenar has to be al darke. Take the simplicity and the sincerity of children and in that spirit rear them. In other words, the childish naivete is not just a simplicity and a lack of sophistication. It's a natural tendency towards faith. And this natural tendency towards faith is not coming from a lack of intelligence. It's actually coming from a greater sensitivity, a greater ruchni is the kite, because they've been less exposed and so forth and so on. Put the abish there. Put the truth into that space. And of course, all of us know the, the communist philosophy about this, they argued that this is called brainwashing. And they said, do not put faith into the minds of children. Raise them strictly based on reason and rationalizations and logic and science. And when they'll be adults, if they'll choose to become believers, that will be an intelligent choice as opposed to, to being little children whose parents tell them there's a God and there was a Moshe Rabbein and when there was a Har Sinai, as we say in our culture, blah, 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 where you're taking away from them choice. Now, what is our answer to this claim? What is our answer to the Stalinist argument, to the communist argument? There's two arguments. First of all, what the communist is doing is also brainwashing. It's just a different model, that's all. 
And second of all, and this is the important thing, when you, quote, brainwash a child and teach him about the Abish, the mitzvahs, you're not brainwashing the child. You're giving the child what is truthfully his. Or said a little bit differently, you're bringing forward what is already present inside it. When you brainwash a child with goyish ideas, with tereif ideas, that's taka brainwashing. But when you brainwash a child with neshama ideas, the neshama is already his or hers. And you're simply supporting, you're corroborating, you're making true what the children know instinctively from inside themselves. And this is called the Hasidic Shechinuch. And as you may know, the Rebbe in some sikhs connected with the story that the Rebbe Rashab himself, the, the one who wrote this will, was five years old. He cried, how come Hashem doesn't come to him like he came to Avram Avinu? And the Rebbe said, how unreasonable is that? I mean, why would a child even think such a thought? And most importantly, how is a story with a five-year-old that ever relevant to all children today? Most children don't have such thoughts that Hashem should reveal Himself to me like He revealed Himself to Avram Avinu. And the Rebbe said that the answer to the question is the story. The fact that the story was told and repeated publicly and it reached us is proof that nowadays children have enough of contact, enough contact with their inner selves, their own printer, with their own neshama, that it could be true for children today that they could want to be prophets like Avraham Avinu. In other words, the Neshama is so pure and so close to the surface that children today can have such aspirations, have such wants, such wishes, such desires. So, Chinuch means cultivate the faith. And there's so much to be said on this. This is why when children are very, very little, we surround them with mitzvahs. The Rebbe doesn't want children playing with today for animals. Um, children are told many, many stories. Uh, there are some communities that don't show, teach children how to read until they're four. And the belief that the formative years have to be strictly dedicated to faith. No reason. Not even learning to read. They'll get a little older, you'll activate the mind. But as young little kinderlach, what matters is only a moon. This is the spirit of this chanech lenar. Go ahead, Chava. Now, in light of this, the Rebbe Rashab makes a very interesting comment. I read this as a teenager. Um, and in so many ways, I still am a teenager. So it's still interesting to me. Because I don't see these words uh, without a bias, neutrally, benignly. I see these words talking to me. He says, the Rebbe Rashab writes, Be careful who our son plays with. Choose his friend's Carefully, this is written over 120 years ago in a shtetl. Okay, over 120 years ago, the whole world was a lot purer place than it is today. And a shtetl, a shtetl didn't have newspapers. Shtetl's most sophisticated method of passing the word around was gossip. Be careful what kind of children your, our son plays with, because children today are cynical and they lack sincerity. Now think about today's children, huh? Why? You ready for this? Because they read fairy tales. He says 50 years ago, before children had little children's books, children were all genuine. He says because the children today read Svarim, and I'm assuming that this means fairy tales, Baba Mises, it compromises, it diminishes, it qualifies the nature of their sincerity and their natural goodness as opposed to being underhanded, cynical, devious. And therefore, you can't just let your children go out and play with anybody like it used to be 50 years before, he writes. Now you have to choose your children's friends. And now I want to tell you a story that happened with me in light of this idea. Um, I grew up in Crown Heights. My parents were not shluch. But uh, my home was a hub of Achnas I mean, Any interesting Balchuba that came to Crown Heights was at my Shabbos table. And some of them were quite interesting. <laughs> <laughs> there were times when my fa- parents would ask me to leave the room because of certain conversation or tone of conversation. Um, it was the golden age of tshuva. Kranites was overflowing with Bali tshuva. And, uh, you know, 
There were certain homes that if you brought an interesting and intelligent Malchuva to, you send them to those homes. And my father, my parents, were one of those addresses. We had all kinds of interesting people. Many, many Bali Chuva that I see in the streets today who are now grandparents, you know, were in my house. And I had a man in my home who was a genius. He is a genius. Brilliant. But um, his radio is cooked, is, is tuned to a different frequency. I mean, most people would not consider him a normal human being. He's too normal. Brilliant, a genius. He loves to hear himself talk. Very opinionated and has a temper. And I found out firsthand. I was 17 or 18 and naive. You had no idea how little I knew about the world. I knew very little. Most of the education that I got is from reading that I did after I got married. I had very little formal education. And I have no regrets, believe me. I wish I had even less. So I'd be a bigger chosid. And I, I think I mean that. I really think I'm, I'm not going to say I mean it because I'm not so sure if I'm honest, but I, I think I mean that. And I had a friend who had a high school diploma. Wow, we. <laughs> that made him a rocket scientist. <laughs> and my friend was sitting next to me, and he had heard that the Rebbe had said once at a Fabrengen, he was talking about people wasting their intelligence. And he talked about people devoting you know, so much time and energy to the study of secular knowledge. And he gave the example of Shakespeare. And the Rebbe said people will dedicate their entire lives to studying the writings, quote, of a shikir goy, of a drunken Gentile, of a drunken goy. So my friend dared blaspheme. Shakespeare. I mean, you probably know a lot more about Shakespeare than I do. But Shakespeare wrote a bunch of plays. I mean, you can put his books on a shelf. There's not a million books. Thousands of volumes of commentary have been written on Shakespeare. Perhaps tens of thousands. They analyze his characters and his narrative. They're almost a genius. This man had a PhD. Not in lakes, in literature. In Shakespeare. So he started to reason with us. And we were not reasonable. We were teenagers with an attitude, you know. Our attitude was not that we had tattoos and had a line of yellow hair running in the center. But we were, but we were as black and white as any teenager, you know. So, you know, he hunkered down and we hunkered down. And I remember him getting up, standing up, and absolutely flipping his lid. The top came off this man. He was angry. I'd never seen anybody get this angry in my life. He was red as... I thought the man would have a heart attack. Who are you? You schneckle. You little nothing and no one. My mother, she lived me well, is the sweetest lady. She, she doesn't have a, a bad bone in her body. My mother was so unprepared for this kind of hosting and she did it a thousand times. We had... Interesting people, a dime a dozen at a Shabbos table. And my mother was like, oh. and my father was like, oh, let him finish. On and on. And if your father would say it, I wouldn't say a word. Because he's an intelligent man, and he's an educated person. And who, you, what do you know? I really felt terrible, you know. I was always in for a good fight. Um, I didn't like losing, but I didn't like people, watching people flip their lids. It just wasn't my thing, you know. I mean, another person would have taken him for a ride, you know? You could have so much fun. There's enough energy you can go to the moon with this passion. Anyway, the way the story finished was he eventually calmed down and sat back down. And if I recall correctly, the meal ended quite silently. And he left rather abruptly. And when he left, I walked him to the door. I wanted to apologize. I didn't mean to to set him off, you know? I didn't know what I was talking about, but I certainly wasn't going to admit that. So he tells me something, which I've kept with me my whole life. He told me something unbelievably wise and meaningful. He said to me, listen to me. I have children like you. He was a Balchov. His children, some of them are shluchim today. Mamish. My children were raised like you were raised. When I tell my children a story, the first question they ask me every time 
is a true daddy. You have to understand, in the world in which I grew up, it didn't matter if it was true. It only mattered if it was interesting. And that's so insightful. It, it, it's a window into two philosophies of what stories are about. One philosophy is you tell stories to preserve the truth. You t- the other philosophy, you tell stories to go away from the truth, to create a make-believe. You know, Even though so many of the stories we tell are mamish fantastic. Fantastic means unbelievable. They involve miracles of incredible proportion. But we tell the children the story and tell them it's true. Hashem split the sea. Hashem came down on a mountain and gave us the Torah. This isn't a fairy tale. This is not a nice way to create the first monotheistic religion. It's emis. What you get reciprocally, what you get back for that emis is children who don't have two tracts, don't have two paths, a path of what's real and a path of what's imaginary. Because when people have two paths, a path of what's real and a path of what's imaginary, the imaginary and the real become entangled. And what's real becomes not so real and what's unreal becomes a little bit real. The people, if I may use an extreme form, don't feel. They become less sensitive to... When things are real, they don't feel them as well. They don't feel tragedy as acutely. They don't experience love as really, as deeply. They don't experience joy as powerfully because when fantasy and reality become entangled, especially when you watch movies and television that are so dramatic and so intense, when intense things happen to you, it's also almost like a movie. And one aspect of Chinuch Altar Sakaydish is this. One aspect of Chinuch Altar Sakaydish is give our children a sense of reality. There is only one reality, and the reality is the truth. The truth is, my life as I live it in the Eivishter's world. There's no two worlds here. There's no two realities. There's no entanglement. It's simple, and it's straight. And it's worthwhile. But it means protecting the kids, because the world is so full of stories, so full of layers of entanglements, that not only bring the child into a world that they don't need to be into, but to bring a child into a world that confuses the world that they're in. I remember being in a house on Merkish Lichis, this goes back almost 25 years, and two kids, an eight-year-old and a ten-year-old, were watching television. And on the television show, a kid was kidnapped. And I became terribly afraid. I was, <gasps> And those kids looked at it like without a reaction. I said, you can't watch this. <laughs> I remember telling the kids, yeah. and I ran downstairs to their mother and said, they're watching terrible. And I, this was the regular television show they watched every Sunday morning. There was nothing wrong with it. They were used, I, I'm not trying to make myself a dead I, 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 I watch television very infrequently, or not at all. So when you see such a scene, you react naturally. This is terrible. <laughs> but if you see a million such scenes, when it happens, you don't react. I don't mean that literally. Of course, when real things happen, people go into real states of terror. But Taras HaKadosh means the Ebishter and the Gashmias and the, everything, it comes together. It's one. And it, it creates healthier people. It creates people whose identity and therefore purpose is very, very crystallized. It's clear. This is one sequence of stories that I wanted to share. And I want to tell you some stories about my father's family. My father my father lost his mother when he was two. My father has no recollections of his mother. None. My father's father worked for the central bank in Moscow. He worked for the government. My, father was, my grandfather was a, was a Big time at Chacham, he learned in Avardik Yeshiva, a, 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 a with a lot of Musa, a lot of ethics, a lot of character, 
refinement emphasis. He was a very fine human being, very intelligent human being, but he also put himself through college. He felt that if you're going to stay from in the Soviet Russia, you've got to be educated. He educated himself. He became an accountant, a very sophisticated accountant, and he worked in the Central Bank of Moscow, but he wasn't a member of the party. He refused to be because he was from Yid. He didn't believe in the principles of the party, which meant that he could do all the work but didn't get all the privilege. His superior was a yoke, was an unqualified man, but he was a member of the party. So they had a relationship which was mutually beneficial. My grandfather covered this guy's ineptitude, and he covered my, my grandfather's keeping Shabbos. My grandfather used to go into the bank Shabbos morning, sit at his desk a whole day, and not pick up a pencil. After Shabbos was out, he would sit the entire Saturday night doing his work, leaving three little children home alone. Sometimes they had babysitters. When family members came from other places and so forth, they lived in a room. The whole family lived in a room. And after the war, they lived in a half a room, a curtain. On the other side of the room, one of the head couples of the Communist Party of Moscow was given the other half of the room that they were living in. And my grandfather every morning would go into a closet and put on film and down. My father was never taught to read Hebrew. They left Russia when he was eight. My, father, my grandfather was afraid. My uncle was taught to read Hebrew and he told a neighbor, I know how to read Hebrew. And it could have costed my grandfather his life. This neighbor didn't, Masif, didn't inform. And you don't understand this was the age of informing. You were supposed to inform. So my grandfather did my father to read. So my father's childhood, I mean, you look at the man today and you cannot believe him. He has every excuse to be a basket case, a total mental case. And he grew up, he lost his mother, lived through the Holocaust, you understand, ran from place to place, didn't have a normal life until he was probably 15. His entire childhood was riddled with fear, and, uh, um, and a lack of settlement, a lot of being in one place. He was constantly moving around. So let me tell you a few stories. My uncle used to come to my grandfather in the bank after school. My father never went to school. That's the upside. He never learned Hebrew, but he also never learned in the shkola, in the upper class. He never was brainwashed. In the second, Russian schools were indoctrination centers. But my uncle did. My uncle is brilliant. He would come home from school and go to his father's office. And his father, maybe his father, would sit at his desk, and my uncle would stand at the side of the desk, bend over, and whisper to his father, and Davin Mincha. Can you imagine? The story that resonates m- most with me that I've heard from my father about his childhood, I mean, there's a lot of things and there's very little time, but is this one. My grandfather had a very important position which meant that the government f- took care of him. He wasn't a member of the party, he didn't get great perks, but he made a living, and my grandfather had saved quite a bit of money, and um, he was important. He mattered in Russia, an important position in the bank. And like I explained to you, his superior needed, his superior needed, his superior needed him to protect him. So it was a symbiotic, everybody gained from the relationship. When the war started, what was it, June 1941, the Nazis ran through Russia like as if there was a barren land. It was unbelievable, the slaughter. But they reached Moscow by November, by December. So I don't know at which point. My grandmother died in November of forty-one, probably. She died right before they left Moscow, under the blockade, under the uh, siege of Moscow. The government of Russia evacuated people that were important. I mean, Stalin's philosophy was that the civilians had to stay and fight. This was what he did in Leningrad, this is what he did in Stalingrad, this is what he did in Moscow, which meant to say civilians are going to have to fight and die. He felt that this way the soldiers would be more courageous. I mean, for Stalin, human life was less meaningful than for you, the life of a pigeon on the sidewalk. But this was his philosophy. But Critical personnel, people that the government couldn't afford to lose, they evacuated. The government left Moscow. Stalin himself didn't leave, which is to his credit, by the way. So my grandfather was evacuated to the east, to Siberia. And he was promised accommodation, lodging, because he was an important person. Relatively speaking, of course. 
my grandfather took his three children and traveled to Omsk, which is near Siberia. I don't know what that means. Omsk is far away, where he had a brother. If I'm not mistaken, his brother's name was Nochem. My grandfather had a brother Nochem, brother Chach, and a brother Yankiv. Yankiv was the big chassid that I told you about the other day. Nochem was a from a Yid. His children, my father's cousins, were much older than they were. My grandfather was the youngest. Were communists. But they could be honest with each other. They knew that they weren't going to mass it. They could argue about philosophy and about this, you know, but, but they weren't the kind of people that if you would say God, they would go and mass it. And my grandfather brought his children to his brother's home. The home was kosher, apparently. And this is where they were going to live. They lived there for a short time. I don't know how long. And my grandfather came home from work one day, and he called his son, my uncle, Lazer, who was before Bar Mitzvah, to Davin Mincha. And my uncle said to my grandfather, why do we need to Davin Mincha? And my grandfather understood immediately that this was the work of their cousins. And I can hear my father tell the story. That night, that night, my grandfather found a shack, a shack, a barn in in Siberia and moved his children out of his brother's home. And they lived in this shack for two years. My uncle, I visited Australia, and my uncle described me, it was, it was, it was a, a, a comfortable home of some, that had been once a noble home. And this was a back house. It was a, like a servant's home. Was, the accommodations were very poor, with this big old chimney and an oven. They lived in squalor for two years, because my grandfather did not want his children exposed to this kind of influence. This is Mesiris Nefesh. This is Mesiris Nefesh for Yiddish Echidoch. And I'll leave you with one more story, and then I'll stop you. Yeah? My father was not taught to read. Um, even as a young child, but especially after the war, when my grandfather came back to Moscow, I went, they, they could not be back in Moscow by 44, right? The Nazis had been pushed back. So, and they never took Moscow, so Moscow was not destroyed. My grandfather probably returned by 44, maybe even the end of 43, and they came back to Moscow to find that their apartment had been occupied. They had given their apartment to one of the leaders of the Communist Party, and my grandfather went to court, and the government said that he was right, so they put a curtain in the middle of the room, and each had a half a room. Can you imagine? And they promised that they're going to find other accommodations for this other couple. I don't know how long they lived together, but my father told me that his grandfather, my grandfather overheard the wife of this couple saying to a neighbor, he prays every day. Um, she had, had she reported him, they would have they would have thrown the key away. They would have put him in jail, thrown the key. But they didn't. You know? And later on, towards the end of the war, and once it was over, my grandfather would send the children to uh, to uh, to Asia, where his my great grandfather lived. He was a Hasidic Shayid, and so they got some Yiddish guy there, and so forth and so on. There's a lot to tell, but just one story. My father was desperate to learn Torah. He had an obsession to learn Torah. He didn't have it, and they were sitting on the train leaving Russia. And he had been bothering his father to teach him Torah. My grandfather had refused, refused. He was afraid. And as they were leaving Russia, my grandfather says, now I'll teach you Tera. And he opened up a Siddish, and he taught him by Hiachar. The first thing my father ever learned was the Akedah. And my father said, every Pusik, I would stop my father and ask him, are you sure this is Chumash? <laughs> are you sure? Because it was a Siddish. Are you sure it's Chumash? He says, yeah, I'm sure it's Chumash. 